So one of the topics that we've been covering is reindustrializing America, trying to get more manufacturing, more productive capacity back here, and not just in the United States in general, although that would be great, uh, decentralized and in different communities. But we're running into some hurdles. Uh, if you're part of this manufacturing conversation, you've already seen people talk about the fact that you can get finished parts from China for less than you can get raw materials uh, here in the United States. And I wanted to test that by buying some different things direct from China on AliExpress and then buying the exact same raw materials that you would need to create this part from McMaster Car. Now, uh, if you don't know what McMaster Car is, uh, you should. This is their catalog. They have the best catalog in the business. It has almost everything in it that you could possibly want to buy if you are a manufacturing company. Everything from tools to raw materials and everything in between. And then uh, if you don't want to have a catalog like this lying around your shop, you can go to their website. They have the best website and the best app. Now, people in the comments will be pointing out that when you buy small raw materials from McMaster Car, you are paying a little bit extra because they show up the next day. But uh, to kind of make it more apples to apples, I bought these parts direct from AliExpress. Uh, not direct from a manufacturer. And the first one we're gonna compare is this particular very simple wire EDM cut and uh, basic machine faced gear. Six bucks on AliExpress. And then raw steel that uh, you could cut that gear out of on McMaster car. Also six bucks plus shipping. So if I wanna compete with China making this part, uh, I gotta be able to cut it for free. And then uh, let's check out a more complicated lifting gear. This is a much more complex operation. Uh, a lot of very complicated machining has gone into this part and uh, it looks quite good. Some roughness around the broaching there, but that's gonna work fine. 12 bucks from mainland China and then a slightly larger piece of steel than you necessarily need because I need to be able to clamp it properly. 15 bucks from Georgia right down the road. Uh, I mean, the, this is the case with everything. These one, two, three blocks straight from China, not precise enough that I would build like an optical bench around them, but for stuff we do around the shop here, perfect, eight bucks each. $16 for that, 20 bucks for a chunk of steel that uh, you could make them out of. Actually, technically, I need to get a larger piece of steel than that to make properly set up one, two, three blocks. Um, then I tried some aluminum parts. I wanted to push it. I wanted to get something that uh, really was more expensive to make than to buy the raw materials for. This is a chunk of aluminum. $18, and then this is part of a turbocharger. It's a very complex operation to make this particular impeller here. $32, so finally we have a part that costs more than the raw materials that it came out of. But if I wanted to be competitive with AliExpress and make this part here, uh, I gotta make this part very complex setup, very, very nicely nicely machined. I gotta make this for just a few dollars. So obviously if we want to be competitive with some of these different things, if we want to be able to make tools and machines and parts here in the United States, there's a lot of stuff that we could do in the machining space, in the tool space, in the manufacturing space, but one of the things that we have to crack first, raw material cost. And I've got some ideas on how to do that. Last video talking about explosives and chemical energy, I mentioned that everything is downstream of energy. And the reason for that is not because 
Uh, electricity is the largest cost that goes into making steel. You still got to get the ore, obviously. But steel requires a huge amount of electricity to produce, and aluminum even more so. So the more that we can affect electrical costs, the cheaper we can get these raw materials. And uh, that's where a lot of the cost increases have come from over the last several years. Electrical generation costs have gone up uh, as demand has gone up. A lot of it right now is coming from data centers particularly data centers running giant AI computing farms making hilarious cat videos. But if we can bring power costs down, we can bring the cost of metals down. And uh, let's do just a little bit of math. Let's uh, say that the commercial power cost for uh, some of the foundries that are making some of these different things, some of the smelters working on this is four cents per kilowatt hour. That's, that's pretty average for big industrial uh, power usage contracts. If we can bring that down to 0.4 cents by a factor of 10, we see some pretty significant savings. So let's look at aluminum. Aluminum is approximately $3,000 per ton right now, and 35% uh, of that cost is gonna be electricity. So if we're able to uh, bring electricity costs down, we're able to save about 900 bucks per ton. That is a more than 30% drop uh, on the cost of this particular raw material. So this no longer costs $18, this cloth yeah, is what, 12? Uh, I'm not that good at this kind of math. I'm better at the kind of math that I can do on paper with a calculator before we turn the cameras on. Uh, steel is similar. 25% of the cost of building this steel bar was electricity. So we go from 900 bucks per ton down to less than 700 bucks per ton just by getting cheaper electricity. And then there's other materials out there like titanium. Titanium is a 30% uh, electrical cost and we get almost a 30% savings with titanium. Now, if you look at some of these parts, you realize that we're not saving ourselves a ton of money. I have a little bit more margin to make this part now, but I still have to make it with very few dollars. 30% uh, savings is nothing to sneeze at, but there's a lot of catch up that we have to do with some place like Red China. Mainland China is optimized for production, and a lot of that has happened because electrical costs are subsidized by the government in order to build a manufacturing base. And there's other things that are subsidized as well. But that $30 savings on aluminum and 22.5 roughly on steel, that is kind of only the beginning because this is the beginning of our supply line. Once we have cheaper raw materials, we can start to make cheaper tools and we can start to make cheaper parts that go into those tools and machines and things like that and it kind of cascades. So yes, uh, I now have a much cheaper piece of aluminum to make this complex part out of. I still can't quite be competitive until I start to get cheaper CNC machines made out of cheaper steel. Now I am able to run more CNC machines machines in the same shop, the same number of operators. Now I'm starting to get more efficient in my day-to-day -day costs. I'm starting to be a little bit more <clears throat> competitive. So if we get aluminum down, uh, we get a lot of new opportunities that open up. The other thing that's interesting is that this is not really a linear equation. There are certain opportunities that open up once costs fall below a certain area, and there are certain doors that close once costs go above a certain area. So uh, looking back at aluminum, we only have four primary aluminum smelters in the United States right now. There's lots of places that recycle aluminum. It's one of the few things that recycles really, really well. But making aluminum is only done in four locations here in the States. And we've been closing those pretty rapidly. We closed a couple just in the last few years. When I was a kid, there were 30 in operation. So as costs have gone up and demand has gone down and stuff has been outsourced to other countries, we have closed certain doors. And when we start to reopen those, 
new opportunities show up, and also with different materials. So titanium is a fascinating material, and there's a bunch of new ways to work with titanium, including 3D printing it. Now imagine if we had all of these advances over here, and we managed to get titanium down to 30% of its current cost. Uh, as far as I understand, it's never been that cheap before. So new opportunities would be opened just by getting it that much more economical. Um, all kinds of really interesting things might happen. And there is a historical precedent for this. So I was doing some research uh, historically, looking for places where this kind of thing has happened. And believe it or not, Iceland is one of these. Back in the 60s, Iceland built a bunch of geothermal plants, which dropped the cost of electricity down rapidly. They also built some uh, hydro dams because they have these glacial rivers over there. And in the 70s, they started doing massive amounts of aluminum production. And uh, they have just kind of continued that trend, building more geothermal capacity, building more hydro dams, building more aluminum smelters. Uh, the most recent is, of course, the Fiaro, uh, the Fi well, it's, <laughs> it's the one that's in the town of Rio, uh, Rio, it, <laughs> It's the one on the East Coast that they built in 2007. So Iceland is making massive amounts of aluminum, which is directly affecting this kind of industrial renaissance that you're seeing in Northern and Eastern Europe, not so much Western Europe. In fact, parts of Western Europe are doing the exact opposite. Germany, for example, has just shut down two of their big nuclear reactors, which were, up until the point that they imploded, working just fine. Now, fortunately, Germany does have coal to fall back on. Unfortunately, the people that shut down the nuclear reactors are not happy with coal power generation, so I'm not really sure what the plan is for the future. But here in the States, if we want more power, uh, we should probably look to nuclear. The, the clean energy capabilities uh, of atomic power are pretty significant. At the moment, we are running, uh, I think, about 90 plants. I forget how many reactors that is. Uh, now, when we're talking about dropping the cost of power by 10x, like a tenfold reduction in the cost of electricity, that's your electrical bill coming down to 10% of what it currently is. If we want to do that, you might think we need to make 10 times as much electricity, but it's actually not going to be that. Again, this is not linear double the electrical production, maybe three times the electrical production should be all it takes to bring us down uh, by a factor of 10. And um, so we're probably going to need another 200 nuclear plants, which is, you know, easier said than done. But there is a lot of movement in this space. The Trump administration has talked about nuclear power. Um, Trump wants new reactors turned on next year, and that is actually doable. There's a private company called Valor Electronics, uh, which is headquartered just outside of El Segundo, and they have a reactor, uh, which they're not allowed to turn on quite yet, but they did achieve criticality recently. So there's a lot of new developments in this space. Some of this stuff could actually happen relatively quickly. So we get uh, power production stood up. We are now generating power. We now have to deliver it. And all along the way, there's going to be interesting efficiencies that we can take advantage of. One is different types of new materials, uh, different types of new reactor designs, and different types of production materials. Um, all of these things, I think, are going to allow us to improve on some of the old plants that have been running since uh, I was a kid and we had lots of production. Um, but there's also things like in the transmission area. So we lose in the American grid around 5% of our electricity just sending it from state to state. If we deliberately stage these extra 200 nuclear plants in exactly the right spots where there is going to be high demand, we save ourselves maybe 5% of electrical loss. But it's actually more than that because the electrical grid isn't just uh, transmission of electricity. There's also a huge amount of raw materials that have to go into building those gigantic power lines and then the copper for the high tension 
power lines themselves. Uh, the transformers that step, step up and down should really not be used sending power to places. Uh, we generate the power as close as possible to the draw and those giant ridiculously expensive transformers go into our new foundries where they run the arc furnaces. Uh, but we will still need some level of power transmission which means we're going to need a lot more copper. Now the good news is copper is a lot like some of these other metals in that most of the copper that we produce in this uh, country um, is about 30% electrical cost. So once we get our power savings in, copper gets 30% cheaper. But actually, it's better than that. Some copper, about 20% of it, we make uh, from oxide ore, and the power cost is like 70 or 80%. And so that stuff gets way cheaper. Overall, copper production could get way cheaper. Now, at this point, uh, I'm being overly optimistic because power is not the only bottleneck. Once it gets cheap enough, we will run into other bottlenecks like there not being enough ore for us to just generate infinite materials with. But uh, it'll probably take us a while to hit that bottleneck. Like right now, the copper ore that we mine, uh, only half of it gets smelted here. Most of it uh, gets sent overseas to China. China is currently smelting about 40% of the world's copper. So just keeping that stuff here, being able to smelt it here, gives us efficiencies uh, as well as economies of scale. So. This is something that uh, we should get to work on. Now, I have good news and bad news for you. Uh, the bad news is that there's a bottleneck that we hit uh, very quickly after that, which is opening mines. It's very complicated and difficult. In fact, your average copper mine requires about 20 years worth of paperwork before you can even start digging the dirt out. But the good news is a lot of that regulatory stuff, uh, that's stuff that we could change today. So there are all kinds of opportunities to prepare ourselves for better manufacturing capability, reindustrializing. A lot of it's just reopening and rebuilding stuff that we had and getting rid of some of the obstacles that we did not used to have. Uh, the long and short of it is, if you take a country with its culture, its society, its infrastructure, and you optimize it for production, you will have tremendous efficiencies for manufacturing and productive work. If you optimize that same country for consumption, it doesn't mean there won't be production, it doesn't mean there won't be manufacturing or raw materials, it just means that all of these things will be done much less efficiently. It will take a lot more energy, both electrical and manpower and passion to actually get stuff done. But once you dial the optimism uh, in the other direction by optimizing for the specific outcomes that we're looking for, I think we're gonna see specific headway and that's gonna be even better than what China has done. China has optimized for production by subsidizing certain things and building certain centralized controls in place. I believe that here in the United States, as we remove those, we can allow the market to optimize itself. And all sorts of efficiencies and all sorts of opportunities are on the table. I want to thank you guys for watching videos that are not normal T-Rex arms related stuff. Obviously they are adjacent. This is our machine shop. This is where we make tools and we're actually going to use some of this stuff that I bought, even though primarily it's show and tell props. But this will go into our pile of raw materials and we'll continue to use it to make real actual stuff. Uh, and then the videos that we're going to be making, uh, a lot of those are going to be very specific to T-Rex projects, but some of them are going to be larger T-Rex ideas, and some of them are going to be kind of side effects of other things that we're doing. So I was recently uh, in El Segundo, and I made a tiny short video out of that, but uh, there's a lot of overlap with some of the other projects we're wanting to do, some of the other people that we're working with, and some of the other things that we want you to be aware of. So Valor Atomics, based just outside of El Segundo, and then Durin Mining, uh, also there in El Segundo, a whole bunch of Tolkien-related companies right in that spot, doing stuff directly related to reindustrialization and decentralization and optimization. So. 
We're going to keep talking about that as we do more stuff next year.